So Phil is a web solutions director at GS1, and he's been instrumental in developing Digital Link, which is the successor of the, of the barcode, <coughs> barcode, excuse me, and uh, numerous other standards. And he's going to be talking about the uh, emerging GS1 technologies for trusted knowledge sharing. So Phil, welcome. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to Dominic, who I haven't actually met. GS1 is quite a big organization, and Dominic, hello. Um, so um, the great thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. Uh, I'm going to talk about a different standard that in some ways achieves some of what Dominic was talking about, but from a different perspective. Uh, also, I'm very conscious of the fact that I am a native English speaker, which most of you are not. Please tell me if I'm going too quickly. Now, trust is a strange thing. It's a very human emotion. Um, it's not uh, something that you can write some, some, some code and there it is. Different people will trust different things. And when you are trying to engender trust, you need to try and think in terms of different sources of information. A couple of years ago, I was visiting my favorite place in the world where I go as often as I can, and I saw this painting in a gallery. And I really liked it. And it was really expensive. So I spoke to the gallery owner and I said, tell me about this painting, because I'd like to buy it, but it's really expensive. And she told me about the artist and where it came from and everything else. And I thought, yeah, you're trying to sell me this painting. I'm not sure I trust you. So I, I contacted this guy. He's a professor of fine art. He has edited international magazines. He has judged international art prizes. He has several books. He's a professor, for goodness sake. He's also my brother. <laughs> so I trust him. And I said, what do you think of this, Mike? And he said, do you like it? And that was it, right? His entire professional career, do you like it? Thanks. Translating that to something more relevant to FMCG that we heard Damien talk about, uh, fast-moving consumer goods, stuff you buy in the supermarket, right? Or any other product that carries a GS1 barcode. You generally want more than one bit of information. You might want the basic product information, but you, and you might be swayed by 10% off promotions, whatever it may be. But also, what can I do with it? In a food product, that's a recipe. In a, in a, in a furniture, how is it going to look in my room? And, in respect of our hosts, traceability. Where did it come from? Who made it? Were any children harmed in the processing and making of this product? What do other people think? And has it got any certificates of conformance? How can I find all these things? Do we have a way to link one thing to lots of sources of data? I think we might. When I joined GS1 six years ago, I had spent eight previous years at W3C often talking about this, the linked open data cloud. Each of those circles um, is an RDF data set. The lines, the, the edges are links to other data sets so that there is a cloud of data all connected through using URIs as identifiers. Now the problem if you want to do that with a barcode is this is just a number. This isn't really, this is usually an attribute. It's a data point about a product. It's not what we would call a first-class citizen of the web. It's not a URI. We need to turn this number and batch numbers and serial numbers and other bits of information into a URI so that that can become part of this network, this knowledge graph. We have to be able to do that. But we also have to fulfill a number of different other constraints. First of all, it has to be something that the average consumer can scan without specialist software. No app required, just point your camera at it and get something. That's a really tight constraint. The other tight constraint is it's got to go beep at the checkout. Okay, don't know how many QR codes you've scanned at the checkout, but it's probably not very many. Oh, and we have to make it so that big industry and small industry all like it and want to use it. That's quite a challenge which GS1 is facing around the world. There's only one way to do it, and this is it. It's called the GS1 Digital Link URI. The thing about the business buy-in, the support from industry, the domain name doesn't matter. At which point, the web people go into meltdown. 
Because, of course, the domain name matters. That's the basis of the internet. You can't get rid of the domain name. Yeah, we have. Sorry. For this to work, we have to make the domain name not matter. So you can put it on your domain name, not mine. You don't have to have some centralized service. And there is that product identifier, that global trade item number. There in a structure in the URI that you can extract without an online lookup. And you need to be able to extend it to include batch numbers and serial numbers and expiry dates and so on. I'm not going to go into the detail of that today, but there's a very, very precise structure that allows those scanners, data logic, new line, Zebra, uh, Honeywell, Cognax, all to be able to recognize when they see one of those things. Because when you come across a QR code like this, at a point of sale checkout or an industrial scanner, you have to be able to extract that GTIN without an online lookup, which is how we get away with saying that in our case, in this context specifically, domain names don't matter. So how are we doing? Is anyone taking this seriously? Anyone, the product manufacturers, the retailers, the scanner manufacturers, are they doing it? Well, here are some examples. Left-hand side here, that's a CNA hand tag from Poland in 2021. Top box there, that's L'Oreal, uh, a snacky thing in the UK, a punnet of raspberries from Australia. This one here, um, apologies to anybody who is Italian or who has close contacts with Italy. This is Brazilian mozzarella. I'm sorry. But the reason we use it is because it was the first product to go beep at the checkout with a GS1 digital link QR code. And that was October 2021. So that's, got, that, that's the modern version of the, if you know about the GS1 story, the first thing that went beep at a checkout was a pack of 10 Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Gum. That's our Juicy Fruit Gum for 2021. Brazilian mozzarella. Uh, okay, all right. Um, other names you might have heard of. So Puma, Patagonia, Adidas. They're all doing it. Procter & Gamble. This is happening. Um, we had some numbers from China the other day. Now, China, numbers are different in China. Mm, quite the same. <laughs> the number of products in China with this kind of QR code on today, 13 million. So this is happening, right? These URIs, these structured URIs, GS1 digital link URIs are happening and you can use them in your knowledge graphs and your link data applications and your RDF applications, whatever you want to do. That's the idea anyway. But that's only part of the story. The whole point about trust is, all right, I've got the information, but do I trust it? I just saw a thing on Twitter just now. Um, Alexa was asked about the uh, election fraud in 2020. And Alexa came back with massive election fraud in 2020 due to enormous vote rigging, which we know is not true, but that's what Alexa came back with because it had got its information from something on Rumble, right? So just because information is out there, you have to know whether or not you can trust it. So we come on to something else. Um, if a product like this says it's organic, yeah, who says it's organic? Did you say it's organic? Because I don't know you. I don't know whether you know what you're talking about. Uh, and did you say that he can say it's organic? Because I don't know who you are either. And what does organic mean? Because your definition of organic is probably different from your definition of organic. And who says that this thing that says it's organic is the thing that they said was organic? I mean, the number of questions from a simple claim, the number of questions, a simple claim, this is organic, uh, there are loads of them. Now, traditionally, the way you found out, or rather the way it's presented to you to find out, was you'd see a little logo online somewhere, and you would click it, and it would go to a database, and the database would send back uh, some sort of visual certificate. Yes, here it is. Oh, that must be true then. It's quite easy to spoof that, isn't it? I mean, it's really easy to get a, a green check mark and stick it on your website. If you haven't got a green check mark, well, Google has plenty for you to choose from. So the assumption here is it's a human being looking at a picture and that human being is getting information from that and making their assessment based on that picture. We're all very good at looking at the detail, aren't we, before we agree to stuff. We all read the terms and conditions before we say yes. And the other thing about that system is you always have to call home. And every time you call home, of course, that creates a single point of failure. So for lots and lots of reasons, that old model from the early 90s, um, and gosh, I'm feeling old that I talk about the early 90s as a long time ago, um, is not good enough. 
We need something better than that. We need to be able to pass a credential, a certificate, a proof of something, um, and you need to be able to show that it came from the person that you think it came from. You need to be sure that the information hasn't been tampered with, and wouldn't it be great if those credentials were part of an ecosystem where you can click a button and actually lots of cryptographic verification happens very quickly and you don't have to call home every single time? That's the electronic equivalent of the old letter with a, a wax seal where the king or whatever would, would use their, their ring and that was your proof that it came from them. The seal itself told you it hadn't been tampered with. You didn't have to, when the, when the messenger arrived at your door, you didn't have to send him back 26 miles to go and say, did you actually send this or not? Right. It's all the information you need is there in the, um, in the envelope and in the seal that comes with it. So the technology for that, of course, as many of you in the room will know very well, is verifiable credentials. That's the whole point about verifiable credentials. Who issued it? Can I prove that they issued it? Has it not been tampered with? And can I do that without having to call home every time? Now, GS1, we're not quite sure quite what we're going to be doing about this. We're looking at it very seriously. We have um, a number of parts of our organization coming together. Um, you know how it goes when you want to propose something to the bosses? And you say, I've got this really cool idea. And the boss says, yeah, too busy. And you go back six months later and you say, I've got this really cool idea. And they say, all right, send me something written down. All right. And you go back and forth and gradually, gradually, then it's at the stage where it's gone to the board, right? And the board has said, give us some more information. What, like I sent you two years ago. You want that information again and again and again and again. Hopefully we're getting somewhere. I can't tell you yet what we're going to do. I can tell you the GS1 as a community recognizes more and more the importance of verifiable credentials, I expect us to be able to issue our identifiers and the prefixes on which those identifiers are based as credentials. So the complete range of our membership around the world, from the biggest in the US and China to ones like GS1 Slovenia, who are not quite so large, should be able to issue you a credential that says, yes, this is your, this is your prefix. That's the plan. But to make it happen, various things have to be signed off and budgets have to be found, so I cannot promise it today. I need to wrap up. These are the things that GS1 is doing that are relevant to the idea of distributed knowledge graphs and the idea that an AI can use trusted information to deliver human accessible information, which is what Origin Trail is doing, and it's doing a fantastic job. Right? The GS1 Digital Link URI syntax is going to be the dominant way you see barcodes on products in the coming years. We hope the original one-dimensional stripey barcode can begin to retire around about 2027. It won't disappear for a long time, but you'll see more and more what we now have to call QR codes powered by GS1. It means Digital Link URI. We do have a bulk data service called the Links Registry and verified by GS1 where you can get, where we allow our members to register links from their product or their asset, whatever it may be, to multiple sources of information, including certificates. That's a bulk data service that you would need to talk to people like GS1 Slovenia about to access that. But there's also a free, uh, unrestricted, resilient, performant lookup service for live lookups called the Resolver. That's there, there's open source code, you can roll your own, that's all there. Um, Dominic talked about EPCIS, which means I didn't have to, um, which is good because he knows more about it than me. EPCIS was recently updated, that's the event logging standard. That's been updated to work with linked data um, and RDF, so that's all been done. Um, as I say, we're working out what to do with verifiable credentials, and I haven't even had time to talk about our work in W3C. We are involved in some of those working groups I co-chair one on RDF canonicalization. RDF can be written in lots of different formats, but what you want is one canonical form that you can then hash and sign uh, and send on to other people. So that, in my 15 minutes, is where GS1 is today. Thank you very much.